Welcome to First Do No Harm with Massachusetts Citizens for Life board member and physician, Dr. Mark Rollo. This broadcast will focus on medical ethics from a Catholic perspective and address abortion, physician-assisted suicide, contraception, natural family planning, IVF, healthcare proxy, and other topics. Please be advised that this show may not be appropriate for children under 13. Hello and welcome back to First Do No Harm, a show about medical ethics from a Catholic perspective. I'm Dr. Mark Rollo. The last three shows highlighted the dangers of legalizing assisted suicide. We did so in the context of a revealing interview with international speaker and author regarding life issues, Stephanie Gray Connors. We reviewed the fact that the death lobby, once again, has Massachusetts in its crosshairs. I have pointed out how they use euphemism to cloak their evil intention. They speak of death with dignity, compassion and choices, medical aid in dying, and end-of-life options. But we already have the ethical end-of-life options of hospice and palliative care. Suicide is not dignified for the victim or the society that allows it to happen. It is certainly not dignified for a physician, a healer, to become a killer. Choice is an illusion for the poor, minorities, marginalized, and those with disabilities who will be steered toward suicide by profit-minded insurance companies and deficit-ridden government. True compassion literally means to suffer with, suffer with the person while trying to ease his suffering as well as to find meaning, purpose, and hope in the suffering. By contrast, the purveyors of despair and death seek to end suffering by ending the life of the suffering patient. Assisted suicide opponent Wesley J. Smith has said, we must not allow pro-assisted suicide activists to euphemize, then euthanize. Assisted suicide is an attempt to expand the death culture, which is an increasing reality in the world in which we live. This is part of a utopian and utilitarian effort to advance the movement of radical autonomy and a so-called right to die. The disguised motivation is not really radical autonomy, but radical control. It is not about the right to die, but the state's right to kill, with the healthcare industry functioning as death-dealing agents of the state. You see, cost control is part of controlling a population. And if people who are considered expensive and useless can be eliminated, there is more money available to the state to further exert their control. If this sounds unbelievable... Consider these remarks from Dr. Mark S. Makazi, M-I-C-O-Z-Z-I, Dr. Mark S. Makazi, M.D., Ph.D., physician and anthropologist, who once directed the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C., In 1993, he commented on an exhibition which had recently been brought to Washington from Berlin. It was entitled, The Value of the Human Being, Medicine in Germany, 1918-1945. to 
In this article, he wrote, Today we are concerned about issues such as doctor-assisted suicide, abortion, the use of fetal tissue, genetic screening, birth control and sterilization, health care rationing, and the ethics of medical research on animals and humans. These subjects are major challenges in both ethics and economics at the end of the 20th century. But at the beginning of the 20th century, the desire to create a more scientific medical practice and research had already raised the issues of euthanasia, eugenics, and medical experimentation on human subjects. In addition, the increasing involvement of the German government in medical care and funding medical research established the government medical complex that the National Socialists later used to execute their extermination policies. Dr. Makazi continued in this article. Following World War I, there had been a concern among some in Germany that the war had decimated the ranks of the qualified and strong, while weak, unqualified, and inferior people had been spared. Many felt that scant resources should not be wasted on the sick and suffering. The philosophy of the unimportance of the individual in favor of the people, das Volk, led to the belief that individuals who had become, quote, worthless defective parts, unquote, had to be sacrificed or discarded. Now, I believe that we in the United States are marching down the same path of institutionalized death with physicians acting as executioners, just as they did in Nazi Germany. One way to attempt to institutionalize death is not only to legalize assisted suicide, but also create documents and policies which try to cement the path toward choosing death instead of choosing life. Call it building an infrastructure of death. One way this is attempted is to have people unwittingly sign a document which favors death. Most is such a document. Most stands for Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Some states use the term POLST, which stands for Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Whatever the acronym, it is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Like the serpent in the Garden of Eden, the most form seeks to say, you want to be in control, don't you? You want to be in charge of how you live your life, right? Surely you want to determine what is right or wrong for you, including the circumstances of your death, don't you? But we all know how this story ends. It is the serpent that wants to be in control while making his victims think that they are in control. And the destination is death. Most, like the assisted suicide movement in the United States, also began in Oregon, which should tell you all you need to know regarding the underlying motivation for most. For the next few shows, I will expand on the dangers of medical orders of life-sustaining treatment and do so while interviewing an expert on the most 
movement. Let us first, as always, begin with prayer. For as stated by the U.S. Catholic bishops, only with prayer, prayer that storms the heavens for justice and mercy, prayer that cleanses our hearts and souls, will the culture of death that surrounds us today be replaced with a culture of life. O God, help us realize that you are in loving control of all things. Only when we truly understand this will we be truly free. Free to do your will in the service of life. Help us to realize that only by submitting to your will, instead of exerting our own will, will we have life and have it more abundantly. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Patricia Stewart is an experienced lawyer, and she is the executive director of Massachusetts Citizens for Life. She is also an expert regarding the MOLST document, as well as the more appropriate alternative documents for end-of-life decision-making, which are person-focused, not bureaucracy-focused. I recently spoke to her regarding the dangers of the MOLST movement, Here is part one of my interview with Patricia Stewart. With me now is Patricia Stewart. Pat is a Massachusetts native and has practiced law in Massachusetts for over 35 years. After 25 years as a trial lawyer in the area of aviation law, representing victims of aircraft accidents, she turned her attention to health care. And she uh, represented patients and families confronting claims of medical futility or denial of medical care and advising clients on end-of-life planning. In 2007, she authored and published the Health Care Decision Guide for Catholics, which is a very good guide, which I uh, recently read and and it uh, reads very quickly. It is a how-to for... Uh, patients and caregivers seeking to make medical choices according to Catholic teaching. This guide carries the imprimatur of uh, Sean Cardinal O'Malley, Archbishop of Boston. But for the past 14 years, Pat has instructed lay and religious audiences on end-of-life issues, advanced health care planning, and developments in uh, health care law affecting patients' uh, rights, and uh, I've uh, attended uh, one of those uh, talks. Currently, Pat is the executive director for Massachusetts Citizens for Life, the oldest pro-life organization in the state. In addition to managing the business of the corporation, Pat also drafts and files pro-life legislation. And in a future show, I would uh, like to have... Pat come back and talk about that. She testifies regularly in state legislative committee hearings and advocates on behalf of every individual's right to life from conception to natural death. Pat also serves on the board of directors of the Pro-Life Legal Defense Fund and is an allied attorney with Alliance Defending Freedom. Pat lives in uh, Norwell, Mass., where she continues 30 years of service to her parish as a lector and an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion. So welcome, Pat. Thank you, Mark. I'm delighted to be with you today. You've uh, had a very uh, varied background and are a very busy lady. I was asking to um, have you... Uh, come on the program primarily to talk about uh, the uh, MOLST form, the Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. But before we go into that, 
And I, I, I should also say that uh, it's a very appropriate time to be doing that because uh, we just did a series of shows on the dangers of um, assisted suicide legislation. And uh, this kind of fits right in uh, with that. But I was intrigued when I read through your bio that you were a trial lawyer in aviation law uh, initially. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and, and how you made the transition to uh, health care law. Yes, I will. Uh, well, as, as you said, for 25 years, I represented people who had been injured in aircraft accidents all throughout uh, the United States. And I loved the law. I thought I would be doing that work for as long as I was able to work. But the Lord had other ideas in mind, and the day came after 25 years that I was just burned out. And I knew I had to do something else. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what it would be, but I started praying for a new direction. Mm -hmm. And in 2005, my prayer was answered when the Terry Schiavo case oh, was yes. in the news. And your listeners may remember that Terry was a woman, young woman in Florida, in a persistent vegetative state. Right. She was um, breathing on her own, but she was being kept alive with a feeding tube that was mm -hmm. providing her with nutrition. Her husband had petitioned the Florida court to disconnect her feeding tube, which would, of course, cause her death. Yes. Um, at the time, it was in the news, and all I knew about whatever the Catholic Church had to say about that was what I read in newspapers. I had never given it a lot of any intentional thought. Out of the blue one day, someone said to me, you're a lawyer, you should write a health care proxy for Catholics hmm. so they know how to make those kinds of decisions in those mm -hmm. situations. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's an intriguing idea. It's not my field, but I'm going to look into it. Mm. Well, I did the research. That led me to draft a Massachusetts health care proxy for Catholics. Mm hmm and after that was done, I had all this research material, and again, once again, I think the prodding of the Holy Spirit kept inspiring yes. me to say, you can't just keep this all to yourself, you should make the information known to people mm -hmm. on a much more wider scale. So what I did was write the little book that you've referred to, the right. Health Care Decision Guide for Catholics. I started doing public speaking and teaching, and um, when I was invited to speak at an MCFL convention, uh, on the book, I was later invited to become executive director, and I've been advocating for pro-life issues and patient rights ever since that time. Yeah, as you say, it's amazing how the uh, Holy Spirit uh, guides us, and uh, sometimes we just need to, you know, have our ears open and, and pay attention to when we're getting that kind of um, guidance. Absolutely. So the the most form is a sort of a critical piece, and, and, and the fact that you started to give some Catholic advice, it, it's a much needed thing, because the, a lot of the forms that are out there regarding end-of-life care are very secularized, and it can be very confusing to uh, everybody, but especially Catholics who want to uh, follow their faith in making um, end-of-life uh, decisions. That's absolutely true, and what's particularly difficult about the mold form is that it's a very complex document, Yes, um, full of areas that can trip people up mm -hmm. uh, and end up having them make decisions that have adverse life-threatening consequences. Those are what I call the traps in the form. Yes, and I, and I saw that, um, I attended a lecture that you gave on that and, and have a, an outline that you uh, gave on that, and um, so I'd like to go through that, and, and I'd just like to say at the outset that um, I first became aware of the of the of these most forms, medical order for life-sustaining treatment, about five years ago, and uh, I have to say that it was very alarming, and I couldn't really initially put my finger on it, but you put your finger on it uh, very well, and uh, as you go through the different traps in this form... Um, but before we get into those actual traps, what, from your perspective, um, when did you first become aware of these forms, and what do you think was uh, sort of uh, behind the development of it? Well, I first became aware of them back in 2010, mm -hmm. when the expert panel that had been convened to study these forms 
was issuing um, its report. This whole process actually began in 1991 in Oregon, mm-hmm. which is, of course, we know the source of the um, assisted suicide initiative. Right. It was the same group of medical ethicists at the Oregon Health and Uni- uh, Science University right. that devised this project called um, Physician Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment Program, mm-hmm. o- known by the acronym P-O-L-S-T, or POLST. Right. It was supposed to be ostensibly to protect patient preferences for treatment at the end of life, where a patient could indicate in advance whether um, they wanted to be treated and their life saved in an emergency or end-of-life condition. Mm -hmm. It's now in use and development in all the states in the United States. It's spread like wildfire. And the Massachusetts version is what we call the Medical Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment, known Mm -hmm. by the initials Mm M-O-L-S-T. Well, the uh, so that leads us to kind of um, uh, break down the the uh, form itself, uh, but I should just kind of piggyback on what you said, and that it came out of Oregon. So did the assisted suicide uh, law came out of uh, Oregon, and that is spreading across the country too. So it is it it should be of no surprise that the these most forms um, do have a bias toward denying care. And um, why don't we start with the the first trap you uh, you identify in these forms um, or in the whole process of um, going through a most form, and that is that they actually have a website. Well, that's true. The process is one that conflicts with actual Massachusetts law. Mm-hmm. Massachusetts has a statute which mandates that certain medical professionals should have conversations with patients who are terminal, meaning have six months or less to live, yes. in order to elicit from the patient what their preferences are for end-of-life care. The MOLST website, which is MOLST-MA.org, promotes a much wider use mm-hmm. of these process and these forms. It encourages a discussion for patients of any age, mm-hmm. not just at the end of life or with the six-month life expectancy, but for categories where life expectancies are far greater and they have many years of life expectancy, right. even for children. Right. So it vastly opens up the constellation of potential patients who would be asked to sign the most form. Right. And that, and that by the way, is, is the way the assisted suicide laws are going. They, they initially start with having patients uh, opt for uh, assisted suicide in the last six months of life, but it has quickly expanded to include many, many more people, including psychiatric patients, including people who want to end their lives just because they're tired of living. So the same kind of thing um, is attached to these uh, um, most forms. I should point out for purposes of context that the true purpose of this whole initiative from most and this is a suicide for that matter, is to cut health care costs. Yeah. Massachusetts enacted a law that required health care budget to be cut by $200 billion mm-hmm. by 2027. Most of those cuts were going to be affecting people aged 65 and over. Yeah. The significance of that is that it is changing the medical culture to one that promotes hastening death yes. to make that the new normal in so-called medical care. Yes. And as you know, that is completely abnormal for how medicine is supposed to be managed in reality. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we keep hearing that the, um, the, the most of uh, health care dollars are spent in the last six months of life, which stands to reason. And so it also stands to reasons that, uh, that government and insurance companies are going to try to cut the costs as best they can. And that often means cutting the lives short of uh, people who do have uh, a serious illness. This concludes part one of my interview with Patricia Stewart, Massachusetts lawyer and executive director of Massachusetts Citizens for Life. Perhaps the scariest portion of this segment of the interview is the fact that a law was passed in 
in 2012 that seeks to cut health care costs in Massachusetts by $200 billion by the year 2027. It should come as no surprise that Massachusetts is not on target to meet this goal. So there will be increasing pressure to cut costs over the next six years. The focus will continue to be on end-of-life care because that's where the money is. Simply put, the legislature has a financial incentive to cut health care costs and therefore cut care. As has been said many times, once assisted suicide becomes legal, it becomes a medical procedure, an inexpensive medical procedure, and deficit-ridden governments as well as profit-minded insurance companies have and will steer the poor, minorities, and those with disabilities toward suicide. Assisted suicide is a way for politicians and bureaucrats to cut costs by cutting life short. Most medical orders for life-sustaining treatment provides another mechanism for trapping people into limiting expensive care. Tune in next week for part two of my interview with Patricia Stewart and hear about more appropriate avenues for decision-making at the end of life. Until next time, remember, we should always treat life with care and respect. And at the very least, we should first do no harm. Thank you for tuning in to First Do No Harm. Dr. Rollo welcomes your questions and comments. You may contact him at markrollo978 at gmail.com. That's M-A-R-K-R-O-L-L-O 978 at gmail.com. Thank you, and until next week, remember, first, do no harm.